All right, let's go on with our respiratory system and look at the alveolar wall, all right? So what does oxygen have to go through to reach the RBC? And what does CO2 have to go through to, to get out? So let's start with the first layer in our alveolar wall. It'll be surfactant. Remember, we had that layer of surfactant. And after surfactant, we'll have the simple squamous epithelial cell of the alveolus, simple squamous. epithelial cell. And all epithelium has a basement membrane. So then we'll have the basement membrane. And then what they call an interstitial space. Interstitial space. And then we'll encounter the basement membrane of the endothelial cells of the capillary. So we have another basement membrane. Well, I'll just leave it off and just put the endothelial cell in next. So then we have the endothelial cell of the capillary. So it's now in the lumen. And then it has the membrane of our RBC to go through membrane of RBC. So it lets you know quite a lot to transport to get that in. Isn't that amazing, both ways, constantly? So now let's look at the um, base gross anatomy of the lung briefly. put in a few landmarks. What is that? Diaphragm. Isn't it wonderful how we can interpret modern art now? <laughs> and then we'll just have our bones up here. What would they be? Clavicles, right? And so we have these two conical shaped lungs that extend just slightly above the clavicle. Well, we can make him a little bigger here. So superiorly, slightly above clavicle, that's our apex, and inferiorly, the base is on the diaphragm. We have two surfaces. We have the costal surface.
And the costal surface then will be against the uh, ribs and the intercostal muscles. And we have the mediastinal surface. So we remembered, I'm just going to do it with X's here, because the mediastinum is the area between the two lungs. So we have the mediastinal surface. And we want to develop what's called a hilum here. It's an indentation on the medial stinal surface. So this will be the hilum. And we'll find three structures here that are entering and exiting the hilum. First, we'll have the bronchi, because we've got the trachea coming down and giving off bronchi. So one will be bronchi. Two will be the pulmonary vessels. I can't put them in because not room, so we'll just put pulmonary artery and vein. And third will be the nerves. So these three structures, one, two, and three, make up what's called the root of the lung. This is the root of the lung. And interestingly, the root of the lung is the only place that the lungs are attached to the body. Otherwise, they're suspended in the thoracic cavity. So the root. only place lung attached to body. Then the lung is going to have its coverings, just like we had with the heart. We're going to have the pleura. So we'll have a parietal pleura, and it will be lining the thoracic cavity, lines thoracic cavity. And what are we going to call the pleura that covers the the lungs. Visceral, sure. Visceral pleura covers lungs. So then we have between the parietal and the visceral the pleural cavity, right? And there will be fluid secreted by the pleura 
between these two layers of pleura. So there's fluid in cavity. Why do we need fluid there? Yes, reduce friction. Right. You can figure these things out now very easily. So if we get inflammation of the pleura, what do we call it? Pleurisy. Why don't we call it pleuritis? Pardon? You bet it is inflammation. I don't know. I didn't name it. <laughs> but just to be consistent wouldn't have been nice. It's called pleurisy. Inflammation. of pleura. Now, do you know anybody who's had inflammation of pleura? When the two stick together, they say it's excruciatingly painful. All right, so this gives us just a brief picture of our, uh, maybe I should put in the lobes while we're at it. The right lobe has three Right lung has three lobes, roughly one, two, three, and the left lobe has two. And we can see why, because the heart is taking up a good deal of space there on the medial surface. So now let's just look at some abnormalities of the heart. Of the excuse me, I had the heart over the of the lungs. Abnormalities. First, lung cancer. In what part of this whole unit does lung cancer begin? Begins in the bronchi. Those going into oncology of the lung. Why bronchi? Lung cancer is 20 times more prevalent in smokers than non-smokers. And yet people still smoke. How many in class still smoke? Do they dare raise their hands? <laughs> uh, you just look at them and you want to say something. Why do you dare? So lung cancer, 20 times more prevalent in smokers. And evidently, lung cancer moves pretty rapidly once it's diagnosed. So stay away from cigarettes of first hand or second hand. All right, how about emphysema? We've talked about emphysema, but again, since it's caused by primarily by smoking, then you know your structures now. Emphysema will be swollen alveoli and the elastic fibers have lost their elasticity. So how will you recognize somebody who has emphysema, other than the fact they have trouble breathing? What will their thoracic cavity look like? It's barreled, a barrel thoracic cavity, because they keep trying to bring in air. 
a barrel chest, it's called. And again, smoking can take away that elasticity from your alveoli. And then, have you ever known anybody with emphysema? Have you ever tried to walk with them anywhere? I innocently did that once. I said, come on, let's go for a walk around the block. <laughs> we got a fourth of the way around the block and she couldn't move. I wasn't sure I'd get her back again. So profit from my experience, but also stay away from cigarettes. Now tuberculosis is another disease abnormality. This will be caused by bacteria. It's a bacterial infection. And it will destroy the alveoli. And replaces them with scar tissue with CT scar. So that's why they can pick it up easily when they use a scan to observe the lungs. Now what about the innervation? What's responsible for you to sit there and be able to rhythmically breathe without ever thinking about it? The rhythmicity, rhythmicity, that's just neural innervation. The controlled rhythm of breathing. Where in the brain is it coming from? coming from what's called the pons and the medulla. From pons and medulla, we'll see those when we develop the brain. For those who haven't studied it. So the message from these centers will go down to the spinal cord. To the cervical level specifically mainly to C4, some C3, some C5, but the main input is coming from C4 and it goes down to the diaphragm. To rhythmically contract to allow you to breathe. So if you're going to cut your cord in any accident, cut it below C4, right? All right, that gets us briefly through your respiratory system. Now we come to the nervous system. How many millions of years has it taken to evolve? <laughs> we give it a little different introduction. Who would ever imagine that little masses of protoplasm could compose a Mozart sonata? Have you ever seen little masses of protoplasm in a Petri dish? Who would ever imagine that little masses of protoplasm could design despicable landmines? Think about it. The human brain has no peer on this earth. And who knows what lies beyond? They still haven't told us, have they? It's the most complex mass of protoplasm ever evolved. And you as we talk about it, 
Just think how masses of protoplasm can think, create, display consciousness. Doesn't it literally blow your mind? If you really stop to think about it. And the main thing, it's thinking about itself. So how is our nervous system organized to begin this journey through this system of the body? So we're now starting the nervous system. You can see why I was attracted to it when I was your age. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. You only had 100 years on this earth. Study the most complex mass that's ever been developed. See if you can make some headway. And it's quite satisfying when you can. It really feels good. So we divide it for its organization. We divide it into a central nervous system. Very briefly here, very simplistically for those who haven't had any study of the nervous system. Central nervous system, we just abbreviate CNS. It's going to consist of the central nervous system, the brain, the spinal cord. So important that it gets its own bony protection. Completely surrounded. Spinal cord gets vertebrae. Then we have the peripheral nervous system. Peripheral nervous system. This PNS. What does the PNS consist of? It consists of cranial and spinal nerves. Cranial nerves spinal nerves. How many cranial nerves do you have? You only have 12? Only 12? 12 pairs of cranial nerves, right? <laughs> you have to be specific. How many spinal nerves do you have? Never counted them? Well, good guess, but not quite. 31 pairs of spinal nerves. So they're going to be bringing in information to the central nervous system for processing and then taking it back out again. So with our spinal nerves, we're going to have both sensory and motor components in a nerve. We call these afferent, that will be sensory, and efferent, these will be motor. And so all spinal nerves have an afferent and efferent component. Cranial nerves, some of them we'll see, will be strictly afferent. Some will be efferent. And some will be both. Afferent and efferent. But we'll see those as we develop the system. And then the third division is our autonomic nervous system. the ANS, or also called visceral nervous system. 
It will be involuntary. It will be going to hollow organs or viscera. That's why visceral nervous system. Viscera or hollow organs. So it will chiefly be supplying, it supplies smooth muscle, what other kind of muscle? You only have three kinds. Pardon? The cardiac. Right, because all the others over there were all the skeletal muscle. So cardiac muscle. And what else? Glands. Right. And we've talked about these divisions previously. The sympathetic, parasympathetic divisions. When you get into your cranial nerves, we get various components coming in from the ANS. So we have divisions of ANS. Will be the sympathetic. Called this originally because they thought it had to do with feelings. That's why it was called sympathetic. And parasympathetic, para means next to, so sympathetic. And in general, we learned that the sympathetic speeds up a reaction. And parasympathetic slows it. So what was this, the innervation of the heart that we gave you that slows the heart? The vagus, sure. So basically, you could go through all structures and learn this, but I think we'll continue on. This gives a very, very fundamental division, but you see they all play together. You have your central nervous system, your peripherals coming in, your ANS is coming in, all of them. This is done for pedantic reasons to separate these. So let's just look at neurohistology then. Two kinds of cells for all of the functions of the nervous system. All of your behavior, only two kinds of cells. Nerve cells and glial cells. Technical term for nerve cell is neuron. For glial cells, neuroglia. Frequently, the people who work in the field just speak of glia. We're going to take the nerve cell first. Obviously, you could have a whole course on it, at least years of courses. So what's its function? My goodness. Well, obviously, it has sensory motor functions. It can conduct impulses. It can store information.
It can retrieve information. And on and on and on, we could fill a blackboard. When you ask what the heart does, and you could fill blackboards with what these cells do. Just amazing, but this gets us started. So what does a cell look like? Tremendous variation in shapes and sizes. So structure. Well, first we're going to have a cell body. We call the cell body the soma. And the fist makes a perfect little soma to begin with, but it stretches out its membrane and forms processes. So we have two kinds of processes. This will be one, the axon. In vertebrates, what we are, there's only one axon. If we go to invertebrates, they can have more than one axon. But we just have one axon. And then we can have dendrites. We could have one or two or thousands. We'll just put many. To bring in tremendous amount of input. The axon conveys the impulse away from the soma. The dendrites. convey impulse to the soma. Different speeds, different sizes, all sorts of things about them. Now the axon then, let's just take a, an example, can be micro long or it can be feet long. So some of the shortest axons will find those in granule cells of the cerebellum, as an example. Short axons. Granule, I'll show you pictures of them. Cells in cerebellum. And in another very important place, the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus. Granule cells in dentate, it looks like row of teeth, dentate, of hippocampus. Which is debatable, but gave its name because it looked like a seahorse. But these places have short axons. So if you're going to try to look for cells in the nervous system that can divide in an adult, you'd go looking in these areas. There are some places, only recently, people working in our lab showed that the dentate cells could divide in an adult in an animal that was being stimulated and enriched. We did that in 1989. Salt did it in 1999, exactly the same thing. I just tell you, for those of you who go into research, because ours was sent into nature, they refused it. Salt sent it into nature, the same thing 10 years later. It was published, made headlines around the world. So, but some people feel good and some people feel bad. <laughs> but not necessarily, because you know you got it first. But it's interesting with science, the way things can turn out. All right, so these cells have short axons. They can divide. You have short axons that you've already studied. How about your olfactory epithelium? 
those little axons that go through your cribriform plate. You're getting new cells there every 40 days. So there are places that just normally are turning over. So your olfactory epithelium, that's important, how important smell was to survival, right? So olfactory epithelium, new cells normally every 40 days. So we've given some places where you can get, these are the main places that have been shown to form new nerve cells. You go to the old literature, it says n nerve cells don't divide after birth. But there are places where there's small axons where they can. Long axons, where do we find those? I gave you an example, I think the very first day when I talked about a pseudo-unipolar cell, but let's just look at a long axon. We can find these, for example, move your big toe. Don't look at it. That's a different pathway. Just let it, just move it down there. Is it moving? First neuron is way up in your cerebral cortex, in your brain. It goes all the way down to the bottom of your spinal cord. So there we are. But then from there, it goes all the way to your big toe for you to move that. So you could have an axon that can be several feet long, right? So one of the places here, it could be a pyramidal cell in cerebral cortex. Or it can be an anterior cell, anterior horn cell. In spinal cord. Does anybody know anybody who has polio or have we eradicated it completely? Anybody know anybody who's ever had polio? Right, the anterior horn cell is attacked by the polio virus. When it attacks that, that's when you get paralysis, right? So these are important. So we'll leave those two. There are lots of examples of long axons, but the difference between feet and a few millimeters at most in an axon, so tremendous variation. All right, let's see where our axon's coming from. We'll have a soma. Let's just do a multipolar anterior horn cell. Anterior horn cell. I'll show pictures so you can see the variation in cells. There's so many varieties. Put in a nucleus. Here's our soma. These will be dendrites. And here's an axon. The axon is attached to the soma at what is called an axon hillock. A little hill here. An axon hillock. And you can tell when you have an axon coming off of your soma versus dendrites coming in because the axon hillock has no nissel substance in its cytoplasm. No nissel substance in the axon hillock. What is nissel substance? Well, it was named after a Mr. Nissel but then when one has higher technology, you can figure out what it is. It's rough endoplasmic reticulum, endoplasmic reticulum, which deals with protein synthesis.
So if we have Can you see that color? Can you or not? It's okay. So you have nissel substance throughout the cytoplasm of your dendrites and your soma, so you know where they are. But when you get to the axon, there's no nissel and there's none in the axon hillock. As the axon comes down, it decre decreases its dimensions and then becomes uniform. The area where it's decreasing its dimensions, thank you, is called the initial segment. Initial segment. And that has the lowest threshold of any part of the neuron at the initial segment. The lowest threshold takes the least amount of current to stimulate it here. Lowest threshold. So let's just finish one thing on this. Add myelin, because we've got our axon, and dendrites don't have myelin. Myelin. It's a lipoprotein sheath on the axon. And we'll see that the more myelin you have, the more rapid the impulse. What disease commonly has demyelination going on? Multiple sclerosis, sure. So we'll look a little more detail at that, but I just wanted to get that because I wanted to show a picture of it. Could we have the slides, please? And see if anybody notices anything different about the slides. First slide, please. Notice anything different? Pardon? <coughs> no, this is, I just wanted you to see what a vocal cord was, but do you see anything new that I'm using? A green light, yes, they say, because with the webcast, you don't see the red so well. So they've given us these really bright torches of green. So stratified squamous epithelium on your vocal cords, terribly important in your larynx. In the next one? Next one, please. And just the shape of the lung, we'll just take this one conical and the th three lobes. Next one. This is our main character for the next few lectures, this mass of protoplasm. We've been talking about the cerebral cortex up here. We talked about the cerebellum here. Here's the medulla. We'll talk more. We're just getting interested, just getting introduced. Next one. Here's the central nervous system, the brain, the spinal cord, but peripheral as we go off with all the peripheral spinal nerves, their peripheral cranial nerves coming off up here. And then the autonomic nerves will be here. We'll see how they're related to the spinal nerves. In the next one, and this, I just wanted to show the hippocampus is going to be in here, in this area. We've taken what we call a axial plane here and cut through just to get introduced to it. It has the dentate gyrus there with its short axon neurons in the next one. And this just gives you an example of different size cells. We had given you an anterior horn cell. Here it is here. 
Look at its axon. And here's an olfactory cell. Here's its neuron. Here's its axon. Here's our pseudo-unipolar cell. We know that, substance, uh, that impulses have to go in and out, pseudo-unipole. But the process is exceedingly. Here's a Purkinje cell in your cerebellum, granule cell of the cerebellum, short axon. Purkinje cell has a long axon. Next one. This is the cerebellum. These are the Purkinje cells with massive dendritic trees. They could get 20,000 or more inputs to be computed by a single cell. Now, these little granules here are the granule cells of the cerebellum. So you see they're going to have very short axons. In the next one. And here's myelin. Here's our multipolar cell with the dendrites. And here's the axon. And it's got a myelin sheath on it that's insulating. And the more myelin, the more rapid. We'll go into it a little bit more next time. You begin the myelin at the initial segment. You lose the myelin down as we get to the terminal branches of the axon. In the next one, and this shows you if we take an electron micrograph, look at myelin. This is the axon in the cross section. Beautiful the way it's formed. I was back at MIT when a lady discovered how that was formed, how it wraps around the axon. In the next one, Betty Guerin was her name. In the next one, and this shows just a, a multi-picture of neurons, the somas. It's a whole different stain, so all the things in between are processes, but you can't see them. You just see the cell body, and the little ones are the glial cells, dynamic little cells, which we'll see as we go along. But I just thought you'd like to see a picture of Einstein's brain, and you can see that with his nerve cells and glial cells. So that's all for now.